morning, Lake Michigan Christian Center. I'm so glad that you could join us for our online service today. I'm Pastor Eric Gustafson. I've got a good word for you to get you ready for the Christmas season. But before we get to that, we've got an online meet and greet. Can you do me a favor? Reach out to friends, family, coworkers, whatever. Send them a link to the service so we can get as many people watching the service. Okay, I'll see you on the other side. Take care. <laughs> Good morning, Lake Michigan Christian Center. I'm so glad you could join us for our online service this Sunday. I've got a great word for you, but before we get started, can we open up in a word of prayer? Father God, I thank you so much for this awesome, awesome day. God, that we can just come and just enjoy your, your word, enjoy your presence, Lord God, to enjoy just time even out in your creation, Lord God, as I share this word. I thank you for just a wonderful late fall day, Father, that I can share this word. And so God, I pray you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, God, what your people need to hear. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we get closer to Christmas and celebrating the birth of Jesus, I, I think it's important for us to recognize that which Jesus did in our lives when he came to this earth and when God took on man and, and incarnated himself as, as the baby Jesus. Because what it was was really a, a grand cosmic rescue op operation because God was coming to this earth, taking on manhood, identifying with our weaknesses so that he could save us and, and he rescued us. In other words, we weren't looking for him. Rebellious humanity was not looking for Jesus, right? But, but God took the initiative and began to reach out toward us. Okay? And so, so he reached out to a world that by and large was lost and they didn't even know it, okay? Have you ever been lost before? I can remember even as a kid um, getting lost at a grocery store. I must have been seven or eight years old. And uh, we were just in a grocery store and, and I lost sight of my mom. And of course I'm crying, my mom's trying to find me, I'm asking people where my mom is. And you know, it, it's a horrifying situation, okay? I, I remember um, on when I first got married and when we were on our honeymoon, we, we went to, uh, my wife Christy and I went to, to Mexico. And, and while we didn't get lost, my wife got uh, food poisoning when, when we were there, okay? So, so here I am, you know, thousands and thousands of miles away from home. Uh, I don't speak a lick of Spanish. And so I'm trying to communicate to people that don't know any English um, that my wife was sick and we need a doctor, okay? And, and that, was, that was a really a horrifying situation because even when we did find a doctor, I couldn't speak Spanish, they couldn't speak English. And you know, this whole disoriented effect of just not being able to communicate in, in the right language, it, it was a very, um, well, you felt lost. And, um, and I came across a scenario uh, where an individual, actually a pilot, was lost and, and he didn't even know it because that, that's even worse than being lost, is, is being lost and, and you don't even know it. I came across this, this account that was kind of interesting. In 1989, um, Varig Airlines in, um, in Brazil um, took off. Uh, th their, their flight number 254 took off. And the, the problem began when the pilot, as he's plugging in his pre-flight uh, information into the flight computer, he was supposed to plug in 0270 but instead he plugged in 270. So they take off, it's supposed to be a 48 minute flight, real easy peasy. They're going up uh, the, uh, the Brazil coast to this, this small little town, this small little airport. And again, this flight should have taken 48 minutes. But the problem is because he plugged in the wrong number, they headed due west right into the Amazon jungle. Okay, so, so they're flying and he's thinking everything's fine. And so 48 minutes pass and they're not seeing, a, a, you know, obviously a landing strip because they're in the middle of the Amazon forest. And of course, he doesn't know what's going on. And so he kind of just starts turning randomly, trying to turn the plane back to where it should be. He loses connection with the, the, the ground control. And, and to make a long story short, they end up going 700 miles off 
off the pathway that they should have gone and they were running out of fuel and so basically he has to, he has to make an the, the pilot has to make an emergency landing in the middle of the uh, you know the, the jungle and uh, the good news was uh, all six flight crew members survived the bad news is 13 out of the 48 or so uh, passengers died and of course this this pilot lost his license and all of the others they were not able to fly again but but th you know that speaks of, of, of a challenge is that imagine that you're lost and you don't even know it and and the Bible tells us that if we are not in right relationship with God if we're not born again if we have not repented of our sins the Bible says that we're lost we're, we're lost in, in in our sins and you know there's lots of descriptions in the Bible for what it means to be lost you know disconnected from God you know uh, Adam and Eve kicked out of the Garden of Eden um, deceived being lost in other words you're lost and you don't even realize it you're helpless you're hopeless uh, you're beholden to this evil age uh, you're rebellious you're dead in your sins uh, and in fact one scripture says in in the book of Romans the first chapter you're fools okay so in other words when we're lost and we're disconnected from God okay it is not a good place to be and yet as we celebrate Christmas this year and every year okay it's God's rescue attempt to rescue a lost and rebellious people now there was a, a scientific naturalist uh, by the name of Carl Sagan and, and many of you may have heard of him from years ago he had a TV show called Cosmos and he did not believe in God he, he, he felt that belief in God was foolish uh, and yet this is what he said he said we find ourselves again in this cosmos without God in a bottomless freefall we're lost in a great darkness and there's no one to send out a search party and of course this is somebody that doesn't know the Lord and he doesn't realize that God already sent out a search party in the form of his son taking on manhood uh, you know in, in this Christmas season and if you look in your Bibles at Luke chapter 19 verse 10 it says this it says for the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost so, so we see very clearly in the Gospels that the reason Jesus came is that he came to seek and to save people that are lost in fact it goes on to say in Hebrews the 10th chapter and verses 5 through 7 therefore when Christ came into the world he said sacrifice and offering you did not desire but a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased then I said here I am it is written about me in the scroll I have come to do your will O God so this morning what I want to look at okay is because we understand what it means to be lost from a scriptural perspective it's not a good place to be we are lost and, and we're dead in our sins we're dead in our trespasses we're completely separated from God okay but many of you listening to this I know know the Lord okay and I think it's important for us to recognize the distinction between what is lost and found from a biblical perspective and so what I want to look at is what does it mean to be found in other words when you've made Jesus Lord of your life and you received his incredible gift of sending his son to come to this earth to take on the form of manhood and then to die on a, on a brutal Roman cross for our sakes what does it mean to be found I want to talk about four aspects of that this morning the first is this is that to be found in God to be in right relationship with God means to be recipients of mercy and compassion okay what is mercy 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 is withholding from someone that which they deserve they did something wicked they did something wrong okay and whatever and they deserve some form of punishment but mercy is withholding that punishment and we know from Scripture that Jesus took on the punishment for every rebellious man woman and child that has ever lived on this planet at the cross so he took on the punishment for us and so in its place he extends mercy mercy so if you look in your Bibles at Luke chapter 15 in verse 19 we come across the story of the prodigal son and, and if you know the account that this is a son that basically said I want half of my inheritance he snubs the father he's which, which is a, again a type of our Heavenly Father he wants to go and just do his own thing he wants to basically squander all of the resources and the blessings that God gave him in wanton and reckless carousing and in wicked living okay and so he comes to his to the end of himself he's eating pig food right he realizes oh my gosh how many servants in my father's house have food to spare 
and I'm here eating pig food, okay? So he goes back to his father, but he doesn't know what his father's going to be like. He doesn't know if his father is going to snub him. He doesn't know if his father's going to punish him. And so he's almost like coming to his father like, like a whipped puppy with its tail between its legs. And this is what the account says in Luke chapter 15, verse 19. Again, we're talking about what does it mean to be found. And what it means to be found in God is to be a recipient of his mercy and his compassion. So the son says this to his father as the father comes out to meet him. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of these hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And here's the punchline. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a, put, a, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine that was dead is alive again. He was lost and now he is found. And so they began to celebrate. That is a great expression of what God has done in our lives is that we are recipients of incredible grace and incredible compassion. And we of all people need to be so thankful for that. And I'm reminded of also the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy, the first chapter in verses 15 and 16. Again, Paul was notorious for seeking out Christians to put them to death. And he stood there as, as you know, the, the, the Jews stoned uh, the, the, uh, the disciple Stephen to death. Okay, so Paul was a bad guy before he knew the Lord. And, and after, he, after he came to know the Lord and he received the forgiveness that Jesus gave him, he was forever and always grateful for the compassion that God had shown him. This is what it said in 1 Timothy, uh, the first chapter, verse 15. This is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Among I am the foremost of all of them. In other words, I'm the worst. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him and have eternal life. In other words, Paul realized the immensity of my sin, the immensity of my wickedness, the immensity of my rebellion against God, the immensity of the fact that I went and murdered Christians, okay? And, and the fact that Jesus forgave me and extended mercy and compassion when I deserved judgment and punishment, he was blown away. And what should that tell us? That should tell us, first of all, that we should need to be thankful to God for what he has forgiven us from. And again, we perhaps are a far cry from what Paul did, but the fact is all of us were in abject rebellion against God. But also, you know what this does? This should encourage us that we've got friends, we've got family members, we've got co-workers that don't know the Lord. There is no sin. There is no rebellion. There is no darkness. There is no addiction that is greater than God's ability to reach into that person's life and save them. So stay faithful. Keep praying. Keep believing. Keep sharing the gospel with them. Don't quit. Have faith because God is able to save to the uttermost those that come to Him. So secondly, what does it mean to be found by the Lord? Okay. Again, this is real basic stuff, but this is stuff that we need to be aware of. Again, as we're celebrating Christmas, as we're celebrating the Incarnation, okay, it's a very familiar story, and yet I think many times we forget what it means that to shift from, from being lost and separated from God and found in Him. So second of all, and again, there's lots of examples I can give in Scripture, but we walk in God's righteousness. Okay, it says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, as the Apostle Paul is recalling what he used to be and, and how he sought to be right before God and thought he was right before God by crossing every T and dotting every I in the Jewish you know, legal system and in the Jewish religious system. And he said, listen, all of that, that meant nothing until I become found in Christ. So this is what it said. It says, that I might gain Christ and be found in him. So in other words, he said, listen, the important thing is that I gain Christ and that I'm found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God that is by faith. So, so what he says is, listen, one of the things that I rest in, one of the things that I take comfort in, one of the things that I kind of chill about is the fact that I don't have to work 
I don't have to strive. I don't have to do anything to please God. Because what Jesus did for me on the cross and my acceptance of that, that's enough. So I don't have to try to be something that I'm not to try to, you know, make myself content or, or to find some form of significance or, or to find some form of greatness. In other words, if I know who I am in Christ and the fact that, 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 that my right standing with God is something that Jesus did, not that I did, okay? In other words, it exists outside of me, okay? That causes me to rest. That causes me to, to be content. In other words, he realized, listen, I lost my ability and, and, you know, and, and my futility, rather. That's probably a better way of saying it. I lost the futility of trying to earn God's favor, and I've, I've received it from what Jesus did. He, what, what he has done, that's enough. You know, and you think in, in the day and age we live in, and humanity, these are perennial um, uh, uh, human pursuits, you know, trying to seek significance in the right job or the right career or the right endeavor, okay, or the right relationship, the right spouse or whatever, okay, the, the right accomplishment, the right trophy, the right championship, okay, all of these, these quests for human significance and, and trying to be righteous, so to speak, so you can brag and, and, and show everyone what you've done, okay? Paul realized all that stuff doesn't mean nothing. In fact, he says, I consider all that stuff rubbish. But to be found in Christ and to have His righteousness, okay? That's the most important thing. And it says this in Galatians 2.20, where Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. So the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So he realized, listen, I draw my life from Jesus. I draw my life from what Jesus did for me. He is my righteousness. He is my significance. Okay, it's not that you don't try to do great things and be accomplished and, you know, work hard and all those kind of things. They're very, very important. But, but at, at the most fundamental level, we've got to be like Paul and realize, listen, as I live my life, I'm living my life through Jesus who was crucified for me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in Him who loved me and gave His life for me. Okay? And third of all, as we're talking about what does it mean to truly be found in Him, to be found, to move from that place of being lost to being found. Okay? Third of all, we recognize that our identity is found as the people of God. Okay? Our identity is the people of God. It says this in 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you have not obtained mercy, but now, now you have, have obtained mercy. Okay? So our identity is found in God, is found in Christ and His righteousness, but our identity is as the people of God. You know, in a, in a day, in an age, when interest group politics are all the rage, and what is your race, what is your ethnicity, people are pushing sexual identity, and all this intersectionality, and all this kind of stuff, you know, incumbent with, with uh, cultural Marxism, okay? The thing we can rest in as Christians is we don't have to play that game. That's just a game. That's a, that, that's a wisdom from below that is based on an earthly vantage point, okay? From the spirit of the age. And as Christians, we don't have to play that game. We realize, wait a minute, we are a, we are a chosen generation, okay? It actually means a chosen race. One of the things that Christians were referred to as, especially in the first century world, that there were, there was, there, there were Gentiles and there were Jews. And Christians didn't fall into either. They weren't Gentiles but they weren't Jews. And so they were referred to as the third race. In other words, they were a distinctive group of people. And that's what the Apostle Peter is trying to say. He said, listen, if you're truly in Christ and you've received this Jesus that was at the manger, or you know, in Bethlehem, you've received him in your heart and you're living for him, okay? Your race is in God. You know, your, your race is connected to who you are in Christ. As the people of God, that is where you identify. You're a royal priesthood. You mediate God and Christ to the nations. You're a holy nation. You are set apart as, as the people of God. You are citizens of heaven. In other words, there's so much in this life that presses against us. For us to identify maybe in a political party 
or in a particular politician or some form of interest group or whatever. But as Christians, we've got to remember that if we're in Christ, our identity is as the people of God. And finally, we're talking about what does it mean to be found in Christ, okay? Uh, and again, there's so many examples of these. I'm just picking out probably some of the top four here, but it means to live victoriously in the Spirit. Okay, it says this in Colossians, the second chapter in verses 16 and 17. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, or a, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So the Apostle Paul is challenging his readers to, to not go back to the Old Testament um, you know, legalistic system. Okay, in other words, you're not made right before God by what you eat or drink or what you don't eat or don't drink or different religious festivals or Sabbath observance and all that kind of stuff. He said, listen, the reality of all that is in Christ. In other words, if you want to see the, the, the quintessential essence of the Old Testament system, you've got to look at Jesus, all right? The reality of everything you're looking for is Jesus okay and and again this is a reflection of what Jesus came to bring and he came to bring the ability for his followers to live and walk in the Spirit okay again this is connected to the reality of what God ultimately wanted to do in and through his people if you look at Romans 8 4 it's connected here to Colossians 2 16 this reality that's found in Christ what does that reality look like and we see it in Romans 8, 4. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So, so what it means to be found in Him, okay? We move from being lost to being found. Translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. It means the ability to be able to walk in the spirit what does it mean to walk in the spirit to be free from the law of sin and death to be able to because of the spirit of god living inside of you and you've got a you know the heart of stone has been replaced with a heart of flesh you now desire to please god you now desire to serve god there's something within you that desires to do good works and to serve and people and to help people and to to bless people and to give instead of to get Okay? In other words, something's gone on. There's been a regeneration that happened into your life. Your mind is controlled by the Spirit and not by the flesh. The Bible says the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. In other words, there's, there's all kinds of blessings that come to us as, as we walk in the Spirit. The Bible says that in Romans 8, 11, that the Spirit actually quickens our mortal body. It actually gives us strength. It vivifies our lives. The Bible says that by the Spirit we put to death the misdeeds of the body and that we we are led by the Spirit. We've got the Spirit of Sonship. Okay, in other words, these are incredible blessings that I think either we forget about as Christians or we become so familiar with them we don't realize that, listen, what would life be like if your mind wasn't governed by the Spirit? What would your life be like if you continually, you know, walked in, in rebellion towards God. The Bible said that's sin, that's death. What would your life be like if your life wasn't controlled by the Spirit? You know, one of the things I, I always tell my wife, Christy, and I tell others this, is that I'm so thankful that Jesus saved me from my sins and forgave me of my sins on the cross. But something else I'm really thankful that Jesus saved me from, and that's myself. And I've said this many times, and I'll say this today. If I could kick the person most responsible for my problems, I wouldn't be able to walk for a week, or sit for a week for that matter, right? How about you, right? If you could kick the person most responsible for your problems, I, I, you know, I, I would believe that that would probably be you, okay? In other words, Jesus saves us from ourselves. Jesus saves us from, you know, from the failures and the things that go on in our lives, and he, he redeems us, and he knocks stuff off of our lives, and bitterness and anger and, and you know all kinds of things from our past unforgiveness right lust what, what, all kinds of forms of wickedness aren't you thankful for what Jesus has done the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace he redeems us from the curse of the law he sets us free and he he changes us so as I close this morning I just want to leave you with this this idea of lost 
and found. As we're talking about Christmas, as we're talking about Jesus coming and incarnating, right? God taking on manhood, the incarnation. It allows us to, to move from this place of being lost and not even knowing it to being found in Him, right? Be, receiving His mercy, receiving His compassion, enjoying that in our lives, right? Walking in, in His righteousness, right standing with God, realizing our identity as the people of God, and living victoriously in the Spirit. And let me challenge you, if you're watching this and you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, Okay? The Bible says you're lost, and you may not even know it. But if you've heard this message and you say, you know what, I want that. I want a right relationship with God. I would like to receive Jesus into my heart as Lord, as Lord and Savior. I encourage you to pray this prayer after me. Can you do that? Lord Jesus, I thank you that, Lord, you died for me. And, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm separated from you. I know I'm lost. I know I've been rebellious towards you. But I want to live for you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart through the Holy Spirit. God, I'm asking that you would just change my life and help me to live for you. From this day forward, I will live for you, Jesus, in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, the Bible says you've moved from darkness to light. You've moved from spiritual death to being made spiritually alive. You move from being lost to being found. And that's a precious thing, it's an awesome thing. You're a part of the family of God. You're gonna live forever with God and His people. And so I encourage you, if you've done that, reach out to me. Look at the, the connection information at the end of this video. Send me an email at Pastor Eric at lmcc.church. I would love to talk to you about that commitment you've made. Church, it's been great to be with you. I call you blessed. I thank you so much for joining with me week in and week out. And until next time, I say blessings on you. Have a great rest of your week. Take care.